Ukraine is a mess. Don't blame Donald Trump for that. Well, you know, one minute. Come on. Okay. Ja, wir brauchen die NATO. Wir sind präsent everywhere, from Lithuania to the Sahel, to Afghanistan, to Iraq, to Lebanon. War and Peace, a podcast by the International Crisis Group. Welcome back to War and Peace, a podcast of the International Crisis Group, also part of the Europod Network. I'm your host, Olga Olaker, in my COVID home studio once again. This is Hugh Pope, also in my studio in my dressing room in Scharbeek in Brussels. This is our 22nd episode. It's the end of our season. We've done a full year of War and Peace, and that's really pretty exciting for us. We're planning on another exciting season, but to close out this one, we have invited our colleague, Alyssa de Carbonell. Alyssa is the deputy director of the Europe and Central Asia program at Crisis Group. The sharp-eared and sharp-eyed among you might have noticed that I'm the director of the Europe and Central Asia program at Crisis Group. So yes, Alyssa and I work very closely together. But prior to coming to Crisis Group, and indeed since, Alyssa has followed and written extensively about energy security issues. And we thought this would be a really cool way to close out the first year of War and Peace is to talk about the implications of energy on, well, war and peace. So I thought that we would begin by talking about Russia. We often talk about Russia when we talk about energy and energy security in Europe. Can you describe this dynamic? Why is Russia so critical to energy security in Europe? And how does that all work? Thank you, Olya. And it's a pleasure to be here with you both, finally, on the podcast, which I get to listen to quite often. I think, you know, I mean, the first off is just to say there's that relationship has been around for an incredibly long time. I mean, the pipeline networks that are in place date back to the Soviet to the 1950s. And currently, Russia is supplying Europe's gas needs, which is obviously a very important relationship to both partners. If we think about a world when there's liquefied natural gas and global shipping, the current fight over pipelines may seem a little bit outdated, but the energy infrastructure that Putin has put in place during his last years or since the early 2000s is going to extend through his presidency and probably as long as Russia is pumping gas, to be honest. So that's why they've become a lightning rod of concerns over dependence on Russia. So Russia produces oil, Russia produces gas. Oil is historically a global market, right? You can move oil on boats, you can move oil and trucks. Gas has to go through pipelines traditionally. But now, as you said, we have liquefied natural gas, which might be changing that dynamic. But for Russia, the fact that it has these pipelines that have been in place since the Soviet Union, uh, going both to a lot of European countries, including some countries that used to be part of the Soviet Union, a few times Russia has tried to use that as leverage. Is that something we're seeing more of? And is that something Russia is looking to continue to do? Yeah, so that's a great question, because, you know, the advent of LNG has transformed markets, because what's important is that you have access to another supplier. So it's not only, let's say, Russia's gas export monopoly Gazprom, who is going to be your only supplier of gas, but that you have the alternative of buying LNG if that's an option. And, you know, we saw that a couple of years ago um, in 2014 when Lithuania started buying LNG from Norway, Gazprom famously cut its prices by around 20%. Now, it's not such a simple story because LNG is more expensive. So, you know, in the end, it's not as if you're paying, you're all of a sudden getting a cheaper price for all of your gas by diversifying, but you have that alternative and you have broken that monopoly supplier relationship with a different country. So that was a very important moment. And the European Union has been working really, really hard to help pay for new LNG plants, to pay for new connectors, to lay stricter regulation that will try to make the EU as a whole more of, of a one single energy union, as they like to say, where power and gas will flow freely and be cheap for everyone or cheaper for everyone and ensure that Gazprom doesn't have a monopoly position on the market. And that's what its longest running anti-monopoly case was about, which wrapped up just a couple of years ago against Gazprom. I find it fascinating, the balance between dependency and the commercial advantage, because obviously if you have a pipeline, 
both sides are dependent on each other. And I, I still remember in the 1980s, everyone was tearing their hair out about the first Russian gas pipeline coming to where I lived at the time in Istanbul, in Turkey. And in fact, it was a, an extraordinary blessing. The air pollution of Istanbul disappeared within a few years. And then a second pipeline came to Turkey from Russia, and people worried very, very much about that. And yet, things seem to have balanced out with other pipelines coming from the Caucasus and from, from Iran. And then we came to the Syria war, where again, Turkey's dependence on Russia was said to be a factor in the conflict. Yet it seems to almost have been a factor that's diminished conflict rather than raised it, because Turkey and Russia actually, at the end of the day, needed to remain on relatively good terms. And again and again, we saw that they didn't go all the way in conflict. Is that something that you've seen? That's a very complicated question. I think it really depends where you're looking, you know, Ukraine. And I'm sure we'll talk about that and Russia's interdependent relationship with Ukraine as the route for most of its supplies to Europe. And, you know, the Turkey-Russia relationship, or for that matter, Russia's relationship with countries further afield from Venezuela to, you know, any of its sort of investments in energy in far and wide in other places in the world, and how that has helped it build relationships and build partnerships with other countries. But that's a trade story that is common to a lot of other countries. I mean, Poland has started buying US LNG, and certainly that's been touted as, you know, strengthening their relationship. And it's not to say that it wouldn't happen without that, but there's definitely an element of leaders in all nations playing up these very, very important trade relationships to frame their relationships with other countries um, in a way that's to their favor, to their advantage. So let's talk about Ukraine and Belarus and, you know, Russian heritage the pipelines, just like everybody else did, and they go through Ukraine to get to Europe, Belarus less so. What has Russia tried to do on the basis of that inheritance? And how has it worked? I wouldn't say Belarus necessarily less so, but Russia inherited, you know, the contracts from the Soviet Union to supply natural gas to Europe and the pipelines, the main pipelines were laid across Ukraine and Belarus. That meant that transit fees and low energy prices for those newly independent countries became the status quo since then, to be honest. Russia also, with the collapse of the Soviet Union, gained new market rivals from, you know, Central Asia and Azerbaijan. So, you know, very complicated situation to walk into. But I would say that so I think in 2011, Russia gained control of Belarusians, Belarus's gas transit pipes. And so the main problem continued to be Ukraine. And there has been two instances of Russia cutting off gas to Ukraine as part of their spats over prices on both transits and for Ukraine's own domestic purchases of gas from Russia. And if you're a journalist for any number of years in Russia during that period, you'll, you know, we, we all sat around until, you know, midnight on New Year's and Christmas waiting for these the new the new deal, <laughs> the new deal to come just 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 right before the last contract expires, which is not so different from what happened just last year. I mean, they've turned off the gas, but they've turned it back on in part because you can't punish Ukraine without also punishing Germany. But Russia and Germany are looking to get around that. Yeah, exactly. Um, I think it's good that you're pointing out Germany, because I think Germany is Russia's largest gas customer. And I think there's also a political element to that, which I'm sure you can speak to as well, Olya. But I think that for Putin, there's a desire to maintain this sort of lifeline in this relationship, speaking to Hugh's question earlier, with Germany. And he probably feels that this history of kind of more trade economy-based relationships is incredibly important to maintain, even if Angela Merkel is one of the continent's least Putin-friendly leaders in some sense. But to an effect, the Nord Stream 1 and Nord Stream 2 is an effort to bypass Ukraine and deliver gas supplies directly to Germany. And there is economic interest in that. It's not for nothing that Gazprom's partners are five of the EU's biggest energy companies in this project. You know, that's Uniper, that's Wintershall, that's Royal Dust Shell, OMV and Engie. War and Peace a podcast by the International Crisis Group. You're listening to War and Peace, and we are talking to Alyssa de Carbonell of the International Crisis Group about energy. Alyssa, so the United States doesn't like Nord Stream 2. 
And the Trump administration particularly has had a very, um, let's say, assertive energy policy. How is that affecting dynamics? You know, eventually, Europe and the rest of the world's efforts to green the economy to to depend less on hydrocarbons and burning hydrocarbons is going to be obviously a very big story for the future. I think at this stage, at least in terms of the EU's energy policy, there's an, sort of the first step that uh, policymakers in Brussels see in that and you know certainly in Germany and some other places in the EU is to shift from coal which is a much sort of dirtier type of fuel to gas power plants for all of the industrial output. Um, so, you know, this is a big story if we're talking about Germany after it retired its nuclear power plants, it's been burning a lot of coal. And so, you know, certainly in the near to short term, there's almost going to be an uptick in, or there could potentially be an uptick in purchases of gas supply. And we have seen that over the last couple of years in order to make that transition, that energy transition. You've talked uh, very clearly about how the EU has managed to secure its position while negotiating with Russia by having alternatives like LNG and interconnections. What about all these wind farms that are proliferating all over the north of Europe? Do these make any dent in Russia's negotiating power? Well, I mean, it's a very interesting story because Europe is divided over Nord Stream 2. On the one hand, you have Poland and some other Eastern European countries, Central and Eastern European countries who are very much against this pipeline, especially some of the countries that stand to lose transit fees, the current routes through Belarus, through Ukraine, through Poland, Slovakia. And so they are eager or have been eager for the US to be more aggressive and to move to sanction the project. The EU has been listening to these concerns and basically has rewritten its regulation with respect to import pipelines to the bloc in order to try to make it more complicated for Gazprom to realize this project. But, you know, this is an also an old story. It's not linked to the Trump administration. I found there was a little detail that some of my colleagues in Russia shared with me. I didn't see it myself. When all of the discussion was going on about sanctioning Nord Stream about two years ago when it started in D.C., some Gazprom executives had uh, printed copies as iPhone covers, a picture from the early 1980s, Reagan era picture when Reagan had tried to limit Soviet gas exports to Europe. And you're going to help me with the translation here, Olya, because it's a picture of a pipeline where it's been sort of painted in big, Vashe Sanksum Truba. A pipe to your sanctions would be the literal translation. Probably closer to up yours. <laughs> up your pipe. Sorry. Are we going to censor the podcast now? No, we're not. I think up yours is okay. There's no actual swearing. An expression relating to the American policy that fascinated me reading up on all the work you've done on this is freedom molecules. Can gas be really free? Well, I mean, it depends. I guess, you know, we're talking about LNG, but obviously my point being that while it's not new that the US and even under the Obama administration, other Bush administration have been keen to help Europe, especially Southeastern Europe, become less dependent on Russian energy and help diversify its supplies. Trump has brought a new sort of spin or a new approach to this, as he does with everything, quite frankly. And it's put up the backs of a lot of people in Europe. I mean, I think, you know, I remember being at a party at the US embassy where Rick Perry, who famously called US LNG freedom, freedom gas or freedom molecules. As Secretary of Energy. Yes, was in attendance. And we were having drinks with EU diplomats and EU officials. And they were grumbling, you know, the transatlantic relationship is strained for all sorts of reasons at the moment. But even among diplomats who like to see Nord Stream to not come to fruition, there was a resentment at being dictated to at kind of these extraterritorial sanctions that the US pursues. And then, of course, there's been a very public outcry against them in Germany and Austria in countries who are backing the project through loans. The U.S. is sanctioning Germany. I mean, 
makes Germans and Austrians, the companies affected, unhappy. Right. So it gets to be a very, very like high stakes game of chicken at some point, because now there's a bill that has been proposed by two U.S. senators. So Ted Cruz, a Republican, Democratic Senator Jin Shaheen, and that would go even further. It hasn't been passed or signed by Trump. The question starts to become, do you really want to, I mean, on some level, sanction a company that supplies Europe's gas and or five of the EU's biggest energy companies? Since the end of the Soviet Union, there's been a proliferation of interconnections that actually, thanks to the EU-style project of making everyone dependent on everyone else, conflict has become less like than more likely, right? If you have a free and competitive market, then, you know, Putin, Russia can't use gas as some kind of sinister tool of rogue foreign policy. It's just not as easy to do. I'm sure there are ways. But I mean, the other part of that story that people don't really like to say out loud very much in Brussels is, and I won't point fingers either, but it's often those countries that are most dependent on Russia, where it's been the hardest for the EU to move ahead with market liberalization because of the vested interest, because of the legacy ties with Russia. And I wouldn't say we're fully there yet. You know, the story is very different in the Netherlands than it is in some other countries in the EU, let's just say. But now with COVID, energy prices have dropped. How is that going to affect these dynamics and Russia itself? I think there's going to be a big impact. I think it's going to, it's going to be a little while until we, you know, the, the, full impact of it really plays out. And we see what the double shocks of Saudi-Russia oil war and Saudi dumping in the markets over the last couple of months and the economic havoc wreaked by the pandemic has really done to Russia's position on the energy markets. Some Russian officials were saying uh, earlier this year that Russia can be able to sustain its budget at an oil price of around $25 per barrel um, for even a couple of years. But, you know, since then, things have not been looking very good. And the number that Russia really does need to balance the budgets without a deficit is closer to around $40, $45 a barrel. So, you know, we've seen Putin reverse his extremely tough stance on OPEC, one of the conditions of which seems to have been that the United States become a participant rather than a free rider in global, you know, in the OPEC deal to sort of hold up oil prices. But that deal doesn't appear to have been a panacea at all for Russia. In the end, Russia will cut prices far more than Putin initially rejected. And the US commitments haven't really been spelled out as far as I understand. You know, while oil prices are expected to increase probably later this year, I'm not sure that the story with natural gas prices is going to be the same. And that doesn't look pleasant for Moscow. The one clear case where energy dependency has been used as a tool of war seems to have been in Ukraine. But in the end, the two sides seem to have come to new way of living together. How do you rate the conflict multiplying effect of the gas dependency there? After Russia's annexation of Crimea and with the war in the East, Russia has redoubled its efforts to bypass Ukraine. However, the delays that Russia experienced in building and completing Nord Stream 2, which it really hoped to have in place before renegotiating its contract with Ukraine for gas transits, has made a big, big difference in the end to, you know, it's been good news for Ukraine which gets some $3 billion a year from transit fees from Russia. Initially, Russia had planned to just sign a one-year extension and had been a very tough negotiator in those talks that went down to the wire. And Ukraine wanted a 10-year contract that would spell out sort of a minimum amount of gas in order to retain those predictive transit fees that are very important for its budget. In the end, so Russia agreed to a five-year deal with a minimum amount, and both sides compromised on outside and outstanding sort of litigation that they had in place. There's even been some rumors that Ukraine might resume direct supplies of gas, because at present it buys from the EU rather than from through reverse flow rather than from Russia. And I think, you know, Olya can speak to this a bit, but I think that was unthinkable under Poroshenko and it might have something to do with the new leadership and the new climate that we have or energy around the peace process in Ukraine. What are your thoughts, Olya? I think this will be something for us to watch. Thank you so much for joining us. That was really a fascinating conversation. We've had so many 
really interesting conversations over the course of this year. You know, it's a great way to end the season. We've talked about Iran. We've talked about Afghanistan. We've talked about ISIS returnees. He, what were what were some of your favorite podcasts? I loved it when we were talking to Ulrich Kuhn about uh, the nature of deterrence, and he compared it to a question of a nightclub bouncer when comparing Iran and the U.S., uh, explaining exactly how deterrence is basically just mutual fear. Yeah, Uli is great and so good at putting these concepts into language that one can relate to who hasn't dealt with a nightclub bouncer. We're actually going to take the next couple of months off. We are taking July and August off from War and Peace. We will be back in September with a whole new season of the podcast. You can can continue to listen to old episodes, though. They are all available, iTunes, Crisis Group website. You can also uh, recently, if I put in the plug, you can hear me get interviewed on somebody else's podcast. I was on the All Things Policy podcast recently. That's from the Takshashila Institution. It's a daily podcast. So there's a lot of episodes. Mine was episode 348. I was talking about Russia's new nuclear deterrence document. So you might want to check that out. To close out this season, just huge, huge thanks to Miranda Sonnex, who made sure that Hugh and I had a plan every time we went in to record and guests every time we went in to record and some background information. Just Miranda, this would not have been possible without you. Crisis Group's War and Peace is uh, part of the Europod network. So grateful to to everyone in the network and to Bull Media for making that possible. We cannot tell you how much I appreciate all of you, all of our listeners, for tuning in, telling your friends, getting them to tune in. So while we're taking a break, I hope you don't. I hope you continue to listen and really looking forward to being back with you in September. Big thanks from me too here in Brussels. And you can always see all of our past work, uh, including uh, the work of the Europe and Central Asia program, whose two directors you've been listening to today on www.crisisgroup.org. War and Peace, a podcast by the International Crisis Group.